Hey, Mary Lou, thank you for coming in. You just have an amazing background, just decades of continual contribution, really the top person in the world in so many different areas, very interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, and you've been doing this like forever. Um, and you continue to contribute in such profound ways. So thank you for coming in and sharing some of your insights with our audience today. Thanks for having me. And uh, really wonderful to hang out with you a couple weeks ago in Qatar, <laughs> where, where this all started up. So thank you for all you do. I heard a lot about your storied career, and uh, I would like to interview you sometime. <laughs> so Mary Lou, you know, I, I'm always curious, and my audience is quite varied. There's actually investors in the audience and CEOs, but they're also scientists and, and uh, practitioners and so on. You got such a remarkable history. You know, are there maybe two or three inflection points that made this wonderful person that you are today? Oh, yeah. So I think it's hard because it may be easier looking backwards. I, I think my inflection points had to be my health history to drive me very hard um, with the time when I wasn't sick. I was very sick in my uh, teens and then even sicker in my 20s. So there's that. And then the backdrop of it is just the love of yeah. of um, really like Maxwell's equations and holography <laughs> and these spinning E fields and B fields and waves. And I just dream in that stuff. And I really just deeply love it. I love doing it. I didn't want to go out on Friday or Saturday night. I just wanted to be in the lab, you know, and just that's, it really comes from at its root that, and then learning how to be on time and do things early and all of that through, through illness and through the illness. Also, I got to be alive. I made it to the other side. And so what do I do with the time? You know, every day I have to take more than a dozen different pills to stay alive if I miss them, I could die. And luckily that doesn't happen that much anymore. Um, I, I've figured out how to get better support and care on the refilling of my scripts, which is actually quite challenging. I've written an op-ed to the New York Times about it some years back. But, you know, if if I don't have them, I just took them this morning, you know, like that's it. I die. And so what do you want to do with the time? Because it's always for me, I live very close to it, to death. So that's wow. why. Wow, that's, I mean, that is uh, such a profound and sort of continuing inflection points that are driving your passion, I mean, and driving your commitment to game-changing work. I mean, all of it. I mean, you've got over 250 patents published yeah. or issued in your name. I mean, this year, your name went to CNN's top 10 thinkers in science and technology and you're, you know, one of the most influential people of all time. I mean, that's part of Time a Magazine. Um, I mean, it just the list goes on and on. And and you're transforming in a, in a remarkable way. And just to, uh, let's mine a little bit of your background before we go to open water, what you do, which is really amazing of open water, by the way. And I've been showing it around and people are going, wow, that's incredible. Um, but Visit. you know, you're executive director of engineering at Facebook and similar yep. roles at Google and, and so on. Can you, can you talk about some of that work and how you got involved with that, that kind of work? Well, really, I, I got involved in the work. I, I fell in love with the lab, right. And ended up at the media lab. I was a Nicholas Negroponte <laughs> <laughs> protege, I guess, uh, from MIT. And he had this, this thing, demo or die rather than publish or perish, so people could just understand what the scientists were doing. So that influenced me deeply. And the, the work that I did was very visual. So you could see, I made, co-created the world's first holographic video system and, and so forth. So the demo and die thing was really profound. And where I think that leads you is to startups, <laughs> because it's the same kind of thing. <laughs> and you're almost always about to die um, <laughs> until you don't, right? Because you look, at, I look at the the scientists or the the engineers or the people that I really admire, like like Jan LeCun suffered thirty years in obscurity. Nobody believed him. Then he wins the Turing Prize, right? And he with two other people fundamentally changed AI with um, deep learning with back propagation, which was enabled also by computers. But they, you know, 
all the people I really admire, <laughs> like, that, like, you know, we can pick, you know, own history, like we talked about Maxwell Faraday, or like, these things. And so I end up doing startups, that end up being bought by big companies. And then um, sort of the big companies are really great at scaling them. And then I end up in charge of new business units or st starting from nothing new business units at, at, for example, at Google and then at Facebook. And as, as wonderful as the budget is, <laughs> um, it's very hard to do those in large companies. It's very hard to do starts. They're great at scaling. They're great at doing things <laughs> in their core. Um, but I find the, the startup um, process as difficult as it is easier than navigating uh, a new thing in a big company where everybody wants to help, everybody wants it on their performance review is doing something they want to meet, you know, like it's a waste. A lot of it is a waste of time before it gets bigger, especially in hardware. You want to start with a small team because there's this thing about hardware that most of what I do has a component of hardware and that's that you can't change it once you ship it. And it seems so easy to say, and so strange because it's you, you set up the team and the cadence of what the team's metrics are really on white hot risks. And those are the demos. And those are the, like, anyway, so it's just easier to do it in a startup form, I think. So I, I go and work in those companies and they're great. And I'm on the board of two large, one large public company and one sort of new, newly spacked company. And, you know, the, the, the challenges are, are fascinating for innovation and disruption for large companies. It, it's Steve Jefferson, um, the, um, <laughs> the famous for the guy that wrote the first big checks for Elon and still does, a, a billionaire uh, venture capitalist and a, and a, and a storied engineer, um, is lately saying, you know, big companies can't innovate in their core. They can innovate in an adjacent area, area, but not in their core, not in an exponential way. Sure, they can do incremental improvements, but if you want to do exponential improvements, statistically, it's better to do them from a startup. And it's sort of a continuation of demo or die. It's really easy to understand. Yep, this works. <laughs> like It's not a paper on it. It works. And that's quite different and powerful, I think. I guess just to lay a little bit of context of the things that you just mentioned, just to unpack it. So, you know, and the, the, the Nicholas project was really the one laptop or child, which became really, really famous. And you, Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I just, he also co-founded the, the MIT Media Lab and um, right. was an honorary co-founder of Wired Magazine. But I co-founded One Laptop Per Child with him. <laughs> so yeah. that, that was me with him. I was the chief technology officer and the architect of the $100 laptop. But I met him in the 80s when I went to right. graduate school at, at the, the Media Lab, which he created um, at MIT when at a time people thought that was nuts to <laughs> combine media with technology. So, but yes, the yeah. one laptop per child problem, we created a hundred dollar laptop that um, uh, the Titans of industry thought was impossible. Um, right. Thought it was a joke and um, it became the fastest growing product category ever recorded in that we collaborated across with for profits to create netbooks and um, made with Nicholas and others a, a multi-billion dollar not-for-profit that fundamentally changed the equation of what a minister of education could do for the education of the children of their country, particularly in low and middle income countries, giving them access to the tools of our time, computers, writing, um, crossing the digital divide um, in um, the laptop I architected, still the lowest power laptop ever made, sunlight readable, rugged, still working in the field. We started shipping in 2006, no, seven, 2007. It's actually, the first ones went out in 2006 uh, to, um, you know, remote like Nigeria and remote Cambodia and so forth. And they're still working in the field, which is shocking because I designed them for five years of life, which nobody believed. Had a new kind of battery technology we put into it. Lots of new things in that in that laptop that I could go over. I, I, I could do a whole talk on that. But um, uh, that was some years back and it was very successful. And at that point, I also had a faculty appointment. I was a professor at MIT. I just thought there weren't enough MIT professors sleeping on the factory floors of the world to design truly innovative things that could ship and change 
opportunities for for the world on mass like that project did and so i moved to asia uh just because also you know mit's got some good labs but you get into a multi-billion dollar fab in taiwan or korea or, <laughs> unbelievable what you can do <laughs> really quickly you can make it once in about three months and then here's the real trick like working with a postdoc or something maybe it takes another six months to make it again but there, you can make a million of them in the following year. You just have to move, turn it into a business so you can ship those. But there, you can make really remarkable stuff that can ship, skip several generations if you really think fundamentally about the manufacturing processes and what you could make using them in ways that people hadn't really thought of to solve problems they hadn't really thought of. And in education and in um I don't know. I made big screen TVs for a while, made laptops, <laughs> cell phones, whatever. Now healthcare, like really, really profound um, leaps are are in the realm of the possible. So I mean, you you so really you invented talk. you invented all of this new technology. I mean, it's just amazing yeah. for the one laptop child. But you did the same thing with Google X, and yeah, you did the yeah. same thing with great director engineering Facebook, and you done work with Intel and. And yeah. the board you mentioned earlier, you're you're on the board of Lear Corporation and also Luminar Technologies. Right. So I now want to move and ship this to open water. <laughs> I am just amazed mm -hmm. at what you're doing with this breakthrough yeah. medical technology. It's, the cra it's my craziest project by far. Like, you know, when people tell you something is impossible, you know, they feel a need to. <laughs> like what would actually be helpful if you told you why it was impossible? Because of course everything I try to do is impossible because no one's done it yet. So fundamentally, I suppose that's true. Um, but I have a lot of reasons. I think it's possible. And what's really helpful if somebody can tell you a reason that maybe isn't on your list, because then you can add it to your list and say, Oh, that's a good one. Let me, let me work on that. So yeah, we're trying to transform healthcare, make it affordable for all using consumer electronics, but not with an accelerometer in your, in your watch. And by the way, I love my, my, my um, smartwatch, but really to, um, basically take on um, diagnostics. So MRI in the, in the size of a smartphone, thousand times cheaper, gazillion times smaller, but also therapeutic. So being able to remove a cancer selectively and so forth and using basically the physics process is that Moore's law is fundamentally enabled as it hits sensor technology and um, emitter technology like lasers and other things that emit sound and light. Our bodies are translucent to sound and light and we can use them in, in ways that are um, physics sound <laughs> and <laughs> manufacturable to perhaps cure diseases that are now 100% fatal or diagnose diseases right now that are some of the largest killers on the planet and don't get diagnosed in time before they kill you or permanently di di disable you. So those are our first products. Yeah, and in fact, let's 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 unpack this because <laughs> it's, it's quite remarkable. I mean, uh, it, it, um, in Doha, you actually brought this sort of uh, head gear. It's really light, and it's uh, but I'm yeah. sure you know you can have it in different parts of your body as well as you move yeah. from sort of the neural therapeutics and diagnostic side. And my understanding is it's, it's very precise, it's non-surgical, there's no drugs, yep. it's using breakthrough phase wave chip technology, and that's the ability to then, uh, as you mentioned, sort of penetrate anywhere uh, without any damage. I mean, it's just so low intensity, so absolutely safe. Right. I think I think the thing that's non-invasive and it's low cost and it's AI yeah, assisted. Yeah, yeah. And so it was sort of noodling on that problem for a while. How do you do it? And I think we're well on our way for for that first product is is yeah to had to had to be all of that. <laughs> that was the baseline, right? And so now we're in hospitals um, measuring patients in in um, in in one of our first their uh, diagnostic conditions. We're also starting next month for some therapeutics on severe depression. And then next year, we think on, on glioblastoma patients. We decided to concentrate just on the head first because it's hard to get into. It's hard for drugs to get in because of the blood-brain barrier. 
Um, it's hard to, I've had brain surgery. It's, it's hard. I mean, also it, this leads to brain computer interface, but I, I, as, as incredible a person as Elon Musk is, I don't see a billion people going for the one inch hole in their skull anytime soon. I can have had brain surgery. The hardest thing I did. Um, it has to be non-invasive to start and sure, maybe implants. Sure. If, if, you know, if I've got full blown um, Parkinson's or something and it's the only solution, bring it on. But, you know, for most people to enhance their, what, you're not going to do it. So, so what does this thing do? So the first, the first product is, um, really it detects um, stroke. So why would we want to do that? Well, if you think of like stroke is the number two killer in the world, kills far more people than COVID, although it's not communicable. Well, so you can talk to a face, stroke patient and you won't get a stroke. Um, uh, it, the, the reason so many people die from it or become permanently dependent in that they don't, they don't walk again, they don't talk again, they may not go home again, they don't have a job again, is um, from th these conditions happen with the severe stroke that uh, is an occlusion of a large vessel. So basically, if you occlude a large vessel, there's smaller vessels downstream, you block that whole area of the brain, brain from getting blood and oxygen. And so the neurons die. We know how to remove those clots or occlusions or bleeds. We know we have technology to do that. The problem is it's not apparent what the person has until it's too late, until the neurons are already dead. And so what we do is have this visor that can detect blood flow differences from right to left and occlusion in the ambulance. And so we're testing it right now, not in the ambulance, we're testing it um, on thrombectomy uh, patients and en route yeah. <laughs> from, and the, at the heliopad at some hospitals where this visor is thrown on them. There's a little lunchbox that has a computer in it with a visor and it um, gets our readings so we can compare them to the CT and MRI and other diagnostic readings so that as we get through this approval next year, um, we can then put this into ambulances everywhere and diagnose if somebody is having a major stroke so they can get to have, basically they string a catheter for a large, large um, clot. They just string a catheter up into your head, piece of steel wool and a fancy piece of steel wool and pull it out. It's a plumbing problem. It is totally a plumbing problem. <laughs> But it's just hard to diagnose it because we don't have any way to measure blood flow throughout the brain. And so we invented that and uh, and invented it in a way that the subcomponents could be sub $100 at scale using basically the same manufacturing processes that are used um, to make components for your smartphone. There's lasers and camera chips that are doing it. That's it. And a lot of math and a lot of physics and yes, a lot of patents and so forth. And now collecting the data to prove it works. But the early data results look stunning. And so we're in tight conversation with the FDA on how to go fast. We're applying for a breakthrough clearance to hopefully speed this up. And there's a reimbursable for this too, of a thousand dollars per diagnosis that already exists. The problem is the diagnosis happens too late after the person won't walk again, won't talk again, maybe, you know, won't live again. So that's yeah. the first product that got us into therapeutics though. Cause we thought, well, once we know it's a stroke, can we start to soften the clot on the way to the hospital? And, <laughs> and so we started to work on that and realized, oh my gosh, we can stimulate neurons or inhibit neurons or grow new neurons or new synapses or, selectively kill cancer cells and not harm healthy tissue as we spread different radiation around with, with playing with waves and interference and um, harmonic resonances and so forth. And so that is um, very exciting. So now we've developed, added to our visor, this capability of doing therapeutics. And that yeah. therapeutic can then go into the body as well. It's just, we're a startup as as uh, someone on my board says, even Amazon started with just books. <laughs> so we have ambition to do the whole body, but it's it's nice to focus on a few diseases first and partner with people so we can do more as we prove this with the data on the patients. Yeah, I mean, uh, again, I'll, I'll sort of go into a little bit more detail. You know, you, you talk about uh, 
you know, these uh, issues with uh, blood flow and strokes and so on. And, and I recall in your presentation, Doha, you talked about 55% I get are dead or disabled. And you can bring that down to 10% if you can get early enough, right? Uh, which yeah. So if you can get the diagnosis of the severe stroke, um, uh, both the diagnosis and bring them to therapy within two hours of stroke onset. Yeah, 90% chance of no neural deficit whatsoever for what now kills or permanently makes dependent the majority of the people with the severe stroke. So this is the this is where the deaths are coming from in stroke. This is 30 to 40% of strokes, the severe stroke, the large vessel occlusion. You can think of it like a tree. There's a trunk goes out to say, you know, three big branches. If that branch, if the the flow if, if now the analogy, if that was blood, if the flow was cut to the rest of the tree, that would be, the, the, you know, that part of your brain dies completely. Yeah, and again, uh, just, uh, you know, remarkable. And, and you know, I, I got a, a pair of um, AirPod Pro 2s and part of the setup is you, you actually take your camera, your phone, your iPhone, and you scan your head because there's a a lid R in the in the camera, yeah. I mean, or in the phone, and 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 then that way it tailors uh, through algorithms it tailors the AirPods to the really the structure of what's happening inside your ear. So in a sense, what you're doing is somewhat similar. You're using infrared uh, lasers to scan what's happening inside your head. Is that correct? And then you could detect these. Uh, yeah, you know, large vessel occlusion, occlusions, and then you can pick it up with a really inexpensive sensor. Yeah, and well, say, no, hey, we, something's happening. We can do, and for a while, people have been. It's nice. It's nice in a product, but for a while, you can piece together two um, D images and make something three D. Has <laughs> been right. doing that since the early eighties to make holograms, which are three D photographs without lasers, where you don't have to wear a headset. I did a lot of headset designs and so forth, and it was a really early pioneer in VR and AR, but in this case, it's more like holography in that holography fundamentally, it won the Nobel Prize. Um, not like a lot of people think holography, like Tupac appearing live on stage <laughs> in Las Vegas, which literally is smoke and mirrors. It's pretty cool. It's something called Pepper's <laughs> Ghost from the, from the late 1800s. And it's cool. But there was this thing that won the Nobel Prize where fundamentally it was not recording just the intensity of light or sound, but the phase. So creating interference. And from that, you record the full wave front. And, and so if you think of whatever, the light that reflects, reflects off of my face, if I record that and beat it against a reference beam, if then I bring in a, they call it conjugate, but the opposite reference beam, it then creates the actual waves that came off of my face. So what are we doing? To, so we're, we've made a laser that pulses because we move, um, but it senses movement. We do say a hundred micron microsecond pulse, highly coherent light. Three years ago, this, this laser was the size of a room and cost a million dollars, but we've reduced it right. down. So what we do is we use that and we leverage the fact that, a lot of cell phones uh, ship. And so there's been a lot of uh, shrinkage of, of um, design parameters to enable um, camera chips to use less silicon area. And we hit three years ago, a milestone that I thought was incredible. It was a discontinuity in Moore's law that no one else I, I can find is using. And that milestone is it's so small. That camera chip is so small that the, the amount of area of silicon it uses makes the chip cost a buck. <laughs> but the side effect is really powerful in that the pixels are the size of the wavelength of light, which means we can we can record these waves. And if we magnify that little tiny chip and we look at like what those waves look like on a on a on a big screen TV, they look a lot like ocean waves. <laughs> That's what we're looking at. So, and we can read those waves a lot like a sailor can read the ocean waves and know where land is and know where the fish are and so forth. And we, we use those as we sort of take a little module, ping some light in and read it in a camera chip here. We can tell, we can see exactly motion because we see the change in contrast and the pitch of the waves and so forth so that we can see the exact motion of this artery, which is your 
anterior cerebral artery, you get another one on the other side. And we can see the difference of flow from one to the other, or your middle cerebral artery superior or the middle cerebral artery inferior. Those are the large vessels that you can do a thrombectomy on that kill or permanently make dependent the majority of people that have a stroke in one of them. And so if we can see right, left hemisphere blood flow with a camera chip and this laser yeah. that's now a diode laser, uh, that's pretty profound. We can measure quite precisely this blood flow. And now we're, we're getting the data on uh, masses of uh, stroke and thrombectomy of, of large vessel occlusion patients to prove our metal, including we have to show stroke mimics and hemorrhagic strokes and so forth to uh, dramatically change the care. Again, it's a plumbing problem. The issue on stroke is it's a time to diagnosis and treatment crisis. And so that just means let's get, you know, it's like a stethoscope. Boop. You know, oh, whoa, <laughs> that's, that's what we envision. You know, I was had a, had a conversation with my team yesterday and I, and I wondered if we could sense it in the wrist because that would be <laughs> really cool. So, you know, but, but right now it's easier to sense it there. There might be artifacts of the change in flow that might be pick up a bowl from the wrist, but right now it's easier to look where um, the actual, um, arteries are being occluded to get the larger signal, but um, it would be great because I know there's a lot being done with heart on the and people wear watches, and so it would be a fantastic um, way to to have um, you know when that happens, have people go to the ER immediately for treatment. Yeah, and and the thing is, you can scale this. It'd be um, it, you can definitely mass produce it, right? So. Yes. Oh God, it just, it's, it's, low it's cost. just, yeah. It, low, it's I, streaming on a lot of the new laser development for LIDAR, yeah. which is going mainstream in cars in about 2025. Right. Um, yeah. I'm on the board of a LIDAR company. I'm not saying anything secret about them, but uh, right. it's pretty amazing how fast LIDAR is coming and the price points that are being hit. And so to slipstream on that laser development where billions have gone into it, Right. We're using it differently. It's a different laser. It's got different right. coherence properties, different pulse properties, but architecturally and from a manufacturing process, it's the same. Right. And so we can use the factory somebody else has built, spent three years and billions of dollars building and not, not right. do that on the back of our investors. So that's really great when you get to um, slip strain behind somebody that spent all the money on making the lab, uh, the, the factories that you want that are contract yeah. manufacturers. Yeah. And, and, and again, uh, this, uh, you know, there's over 8 billion people uh, right now, right? Um, some, some people are saying 8.2, 8.4 billion next year. So yeah. really it's, it scales across all different kinds of populations because of the uh, price point is, is low, right? Yeah, and that's, it, that's, yeah. The, that's the plan. This is, for me, it's like one laptop per child, part two right, for healthcare. Right, like right. you go into a hospital, you look at each thing you look at, you know, minimum is $10,000. Most things are 100000 a million dollars. Like right. it's the land that consumer electronics has never hit. And why? It's physics. We can do better. <laughs> But you look at an MRI machine and, you know, that's really a last century technology. Amazing. Right. I mean, it's amazing that product ships. If you understand the physics, behind it, <laughs> people tell me what we do is complicated. I'm like nothing that I am aware of is more complicated than an MRI. Save my life. Right. Love it. Um, right. But it's very hard to shrink that two ton magnet um, and make some. And so we have to just look at different physics. That, so magnetic fields also go through your body. But, um, I mean, you're changing the spin frequency <laughs> of, right. of, of the, the, you know, the atoms and the electrons and you're like, and then you get the Lamar figure. It's pretty cool. If anybody's really this audience, I think would be interested in it, but you know, you look at that and it's pretty hard to, to cost down <laughs> an MRI. <laughs> and so the, you know, 27 years ago, when one saved my life, I almost didn't get it because it was too expensive. It wasn't standard right. of care for graduate students at Ivy League stu schools. It was for the professors. And that was the dividing line and the professor sprung for it. But 27 years later, the vast majority, like 80% of humanity still lacks access to that technology. 
Right. And so I think we can do better. Could you imagine that in consumer electronics still using something 27 years old? <laughs> like, you know. And, and, and you <laughs> are. We had then. We didn't have. We had big cathode ray too. And <laughs> monitors, and I helped pioneer a, a lot of the the new display technology that has really been transformative. A lot of us spent, you know, every you know the march of Moore's law, every twelve months, eighteen months, making something you know better based on the processes that we had access to and what we could do with it. Yeah, and, and this is such a confluence of all of the work that you've done in the past and you continue to do. I, I just amazing. And, you know, there's some stats that you give in your presentation, and I, I want to give out the stats because they're your stats and your presentation. And then we'll get into, you know, this idea, the, the, the Alzheimer's, the glioblastoma in more detail and, and uh, sure. mental illness. But uh, in your presentation in Doha, <laughs> just a little while ago, you talked about there's like a million strokes per year. So we address that and more. Just in the U.S. alone. I mean, yeah. globally, the numbers aren't well accounted for, but it, it's huge and it's growing in in places with obesity, actually. So, yeah. Yeah. And, the, and then you talk about 6 million with Alzheimer's, 15,000 uh, glioblastoma and 20, 20 uh, or 15,000. Yeah. And 25 million with uh, a mental illness of some sort. Right. A and, severe one. Yeah. Yeah. So, it, the numbers are pretty staggering. And again, those are just the U.S. numbers, which are pretty vetted. The global numbers are far, far larger. So so let's. Again, uh, continue this conversation about, you know, this uh, phase wave is very novel, uh, but you're also using sound uh, where you're using phase, uh, phase of waves by interference to get more information to do more pinpointing. And because you have this marvelous background in chips and chip yeah. design and even this fabulous, uh, 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 you know, screen technology, <laughs> you should have done everything. Yeah. You've applied this to uh, using uh, sound. And so let's get into a little bit more detail on how you're able to use phase dis, uh, delays and beam focusing and steering. And and I, I just clearly recall this sort of a series of emitters you have, but that sound and yeah. how it's delayed and then how that can be used in more detail and, yeah, and things sure. like, yeah. So it's a, it's a lot of kind of, basic physics, but <laughs> things that, again, I've, I've worked in my whole life, but yeah, to make things, I had to learn how to, you know, solder my own board and, you know, design <laughs> my own batteries and whatever, like just this stuff that you do, write your own code and all the stuff that you do to make a whole project work, to make a prototype because no one believes it'll work. So you end up with all these skills. <laughs> so, so, um, yeah. So how do you, um, uh, steer a beam. Um, it, it's like antenna theory and opposite. <laughs> I actually took uh, an graduate level antenna design course, um, which is <laughs> was totally fun because it's just Maxwell's equations. I, I could have gone into antenna design. It just wasn't as fun as holography where you get a visual reward for it. But so in the term, in terms of, of modulating sound, we all know about like quadraphonic speakers and different things like that where there are delays and so forth to make, um, you know, make like, if you put in headphones, it can make the sound can sound like it's going above your head and down. And, right. and you do that by delaying one to the other because it, you, your ears can sense the, the, the difference from the delay from one sound to the other. And they, they triangulate where they think where your ears think it is like, like your eyes do. And you have disparity. We have two eyes one sees like different <laughs> image than the other and we then perceive 3d that way so what what we do with an array of, of emitters of sound or light um but in the case of sound is we take a sound wave and we send it out and then the next one say we delay it by a quarter right. of a wave and the next one a quarter of wave the way those will add up is they can form <laughs> a beam right and if you do a bigger delay, say a quarter of a wave or three eighths of a wave, it, it gives you a tighter focus of the beam. And if you do a shorter delay between each, it's it gives you a, a longer focus. You can use a similar principle to make that that the beam form a, a focus up, down, right, left, anywhere we want to inside of the head, and we can hit any part 
of the brain or the body with this principle with this phased array. Phase arrays have been used a long time. There's certainly been a lot of work with high intensity focused ultrasound to ablate a tumor or even vaporize it. That's called this thing called histotripsy. It's all just using these phase arrays. But what we're doing is using it at very, very low intensity um, at a diagnostic intensity, the focus. So it's even way lower than that where it doesn't focus. And, and really looking at the frequency, the harmonic frequencies, so we can get a vibration of a neuron. So a neuron starts to fire or a neuron stops to fire, firing, which I'm not a shrink, um, but um, <laughs> I talk to lots of psychiatrists and here's the thing, um, it's called um, repetitive negative thoughts. And I'm an engineer and I thought, oh, I have that because I always <laughs> worry about all the reasons some project might go wrong. And like, they're like, no, because you keep finding different ways you're gonna fail. Um, but if you always have the same thought of something that's negative, it kind of wears a groove in your in right. your brain, meaning, those neurons in that clump are just firing so intensely or they're not firing. And so what we can do is do a therapeutic treatment to stimulate or destimulate those areas. And they're a critical part of severe depression. And, you know, you read Freud, it's all your mother's fault, or your parents, <laughs> whatever your relationships, you live through a war, all of those things are true or, or, but like the root cause, if we look at, um, the objective thing of what's changing in your brain, that's what appears to be the issue. And so we're starting, there are approved therapies for this. There's tons of data uh, showing this, that it can be improved with something called transcranial magnetic stimulation. There you really do get into the E field going in a circle. So the B field goes in. The problem <laughs> is with transcranial magnetic stimulation it's working, um, but it only has two centimeters of penetration and you can't control exactly where you focus. Prior to that, they had direct current stimulation transmitting, <laughs> which is like an anode here, a cathode here, and that is far less controllable. What we can do is steer um, ultrasound that can be stimulating. Again, diagnostic levels of ultrasound, very low level, shown to be safe um, on on most mothers and their fetuses in the <laughs> developed world for the last 50 years who've had these scans. Um, so we're, we're starting studies for that with severe depression. Um, and, and also um, there's some other studies we can talk about, but it seems very, very promising as, as something that could be used at home as a therapy for people um, with these severe depressions. There's there's one that I think we're gonna start on OCD as well soon, which um, can basically pinpoint the area that's either over firing or not firing, which you can pick up in a different type of scan and then deliver um, a regimen to the patients um, that's basically modeled after transcranial magnetic stimulation, but in something that can be a you know cheap take home usable and far more precise with any kind of depth that you want um it's the only wearable steerable form of <laughs> neurostimulation um that we're aware of anybody is making so that's yeah. for a whole host of people the um mental health crisis has gone up in pandemic for obvious reasons people have been isolated so we're yeah, I mean, it, again, it's it's so unique, and and like you said, it's low cost, it's non invasive. It'd be uh, you, you can scale, mass produce these kinds of things as well, so make it accessible globally. Yeah, and 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 a a side uh, sort of opportunity for this, or a related opportunity, is is that you can do uh, stimulation for. Uh, you, you know, perhaps neurogenesis. You know, neurogenesis meaning the growth of. Uh, right. uh, you know, brain tissue, or or you can use it for synaptic genesis, and right. you know, the, I think the possibilities are endless. And so, particularly important for neurodegenerative diseases like right, Alzheimer's right. and a host of others. And so, we're looking at what to do first. There, we are a small company, <laughs> and so we're trying. I'm also very excited about the glioblastoma trials that we're doing that are at a different right. frequency still and selectively killing the cancer cells with this harmonic. Um, uh, harmonic frequency, which is a lot like 
an opera singer being able to burst a wine glass in a room, um, but nothing else is harmed. And, and it's at a very low intensity. It's her voice, right? Usually it's a her um, hitting those notes that are the harmonic resonance frequency of a wine glass, but your ears can hear, but not even they're harmed by it. And so we're doing that right now um, at, with brain organoids. We're going at our uh, partner institute, the Terasaki Institute in LA, that's kind of affiliated with UCLA. They're um, organs on chip specialists. We brought our rig down and we're having extraordinary results at killing glioblastoma cells and not harming any healthy tissue, like five, 10 times better than um, best in class chemotherapy. And now we're, we're scaling that out to try that in mice this winter uh, to see how we do with mice with glioblastoma and with success on that, we should be able to get into to humans and compassionate use as soon as, as, as Q3 next year. So that's super exciting. It's a death sentence. And that has profound impact for all cancers, all aggressive cancers. Um, it's a new approach. It's um, There's a lot of studies that show cancers, fast dividing cancer cells, aggressive cancers means fast dividing, they grow fast. Um, they have rigid cell membranes and huge nucleuses and so forth. And that makes them mechanically quite different than normal healthy cells that are very flexible and like, like the Golden Gate Bridge, they can withstand earthquakes, but these cells can't. And so we give them just a little, a little dose of a diagnostic harmonic frequency of, of ultrasound and they fall apart. And when they fall apart, they release proteins that can vaccinate the brain against the very cancer you have. Exactly. Don't even anti-vaxxers probably aren't opposed to the actual proteins being released of your cancers. So your immune system can find your cancer and start to go to town on, on finding any other cells that might be missed. And so that's the promise of it. It's very early, um, but the, the results with the brain organoids are absolutely stunning. And so we're investing time in, in, in it. And in fact, um, we have actually now developing a wait list for people with glioblastoma because it is a death sentence and to see if we can, how the FDA would have to approve when we do human trials, but we're amassing the data that is necessary for us to, to start trying it as fast as we can. So, yeah. And then just for the audience, again, I just uh, want to um, sort of explain, you know, when, when uh, Mary Lou is talking about glioblastoma, those are really cancer cells in the brain. And, and I just love the idea that you can just target them. They, you can cause them to basically implode without no damage to anything else. And, and the release of the proteins, uh, it, it effectively not. Yeah, we don't even it. have to focus the sound. We let the sound just bathe everywhere. We have to couple it through the skull, of course, um, right. which has a different speed of sound. So we use the array to focus right. and and like your your skull isn't spherical, there's bumps on it. And so right. we compensate for that. So then we can do a spread, but we could do that in the body, you know, any place there's aggressive cancer should should this pan out and, and work. Again, early results are extremely promising. Um, and we do know there's this brittleness property and it's at really <laughs> low intensity. So it, it, we're excited about it, but also yeah. we're just starting in mice now. So we're going to the next step. Yeah, it's so novel and it's just uh, absolutely brilliant. Uh, I, and just again, for the audience, you mentioned organoids. Uh, uh, there's a famous scientist by the name of Hans Cleaver, and he, he he's able to go kind of like many pieces of you, <laughs> and those are organoids. So you could have an organoid, uh, sort of like a, you can take um, a single cell and you can kind of stimulate it, the stem cell, and you can make it appear like a brain and start going different facets of the brain. So this is totally safe. There's no animal studies required. And and that's based on an earlier scientist by the name of Yamanaka, who was able to take oh. adult cells and regress yeah. them into stem cells. Once you regress them into stem cells, they could be anything if you coax them and, and you know do proper sort of uh, care of them. And those are the organoids you're talking about. So I just want to yeah. give it a little bit of context. So again, totally safe. <laughs> you can scale this uh, when you're yeah. doing the initial studies. 
We're, yeah, we're we down. give those <laughs> those human brain organoids different types of glioblastoma. So we <laughs> run several different cell lines, and the results right. are are stunning on on that early with real human brains with real human glioblastoma <laughs> um, in comparison to chemotherapy. It's really great, but yes, we, we need to do the next work, and that is is progressing quite rapidly. So uh, you know, we're down to the uh, last part of our interview and really it ends with one question and that is what recommendations <laughs> would you give to the audience uh you know in terms of your work your career and so on so what recommendations to the audience yeah it could be, be <laughs> i i mean i think like really i think the recommendations um it depends what they want so they're watching this so why are they watching it uh, what i find when i talk to people who come up to me after i give a talk is they're a little bit stuck in their career and they want to do these impossible things too. And so like, I, it's, it's sort of funny, like you don't even have to be a good manager to do what I do. You just sort of pick an impossible problem, find a new sort of creative solution to it that adds up and um, go for it. And you get the other people of the world to be the path of your, to your door if you talk yeah. about it. And so I guess that's the thing. If you've got this dream to sort of do something, I dig in on it um, and figure out, you know, we all, there's so many problems in the world uh, and there, you know, the climate, their education, there's health, there's all these huge problems, probably can't solve it alone, but the, the innovative solutions, especially the interdisciplinary ones, there's a low hanging fruit between the disciplines because even though we say we like multidisciplinary stuff, it's very hard not to be like an inch wide and a mile deep going through <laughs> most education systems and most large companies, despite what they say, it's very hard. Um, and so, and so if, 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 if you don't sort of have these multidisciplinary, it's like, work with people, spend time with people that do, because you might be able to find the solution in between the disciplines that no one else can see, start a company, get some funding and, 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 and look, reduce the white hot risks of the number <laughs> the top five reasons it might fail. And if you can do that, I mean, if seem, it will probably seem like it have legs. If you really do pick the top white hot risks, you could probably make a, a prototype then. And get some funding and pursue it. And we need a lot of people, a lot of smart people trying some innovative solutions. And I just, it's fun too. It's really fun to do to work and get to work with fabulous people. And, um, you know, I, I remember I was just talking to a friend of mine. I did worked with my, on my first company and he was so good at things I wasn't good at. And I, I'd show up in the morning <laughs> we get coffee and I'd say, you know, I had this idea we could have far more impact if you could do this and I could do this and this is what we could get. Maybe five X better. And he would say, you're full of shit. That'll never work. <laughs> you're crazy. And I'm like, yeah, 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 I know. But, but if we could do something similar, it doesn't have to be exactly that we could have this kind of impact and it'd be totally worth changing right. this and this and this. And so by lunch, he'd say, you know, that thing that you're thinking about, there might be a way to do it. And I'm like, okay, what? Okay, we change this around. Da, da, da. And then we go back to work on normal deadlines. And by dinner, he'd say like, you know, I think I figured out a way to do that. And so like, it's just, you have to be able to be okay having people think you're an idiot. Like it's also a rule for being a board member too. You have to ask like, you know, I must not be getting something here <laughs> and say the thing where everybody can tell you you're then an idiot, but like you have to like feel comfortable enough um, that it's your job to um, <clears throat> say something that's plain, because if you have got that question, um, it, it's probably worthwhile to ask. And if it is a stupid question, great, you know, fine, I'll be the <laughs> idiot. But like what it often gets you to is a much better solution, I find. And sometimes I'm an idiot. So, you know, like, I just think people should be more willing to um, speak up because it's actually incredibly important that everybody understands what's going on, um, certainly in their areas and their fields and their work and just ask the question. You know, Mary, Mary Lou, you, you are 
such the epitome of, of what's beneficial for humanity and also for earth or for the planet I mean, your work is just outstanding You're you so have fun. this background you know uh, that it, decades it, and you're, you know, famous for your one laptop per child and all of the inventions you've done across so, so many years, like that fabulous screen and things like that. I mean, it's yeah, just amazing. Yeah. And, you know, you work with Facebook and Google and Intel. You're on the board of Lear and uh, Corporation. Uh, you're on the board of Luminar uh, Technologies, a pioneer in LIDAR uh, technologies. Yeah, uh, the amazing. top 10 uh, CNN thinker, but also number one in many areas, the 250 patents. But I want the audience, you got to look at your work now, a CEO and founder of Open Water. It's just such an amazing breakthrough medical technology, definitely game changing. Uh, and the, the applications are just profound and unlimited, really. Uh, you know, once you, uh, you know, go beyond this focal point right now, because you're, you're still in the early stages, but people have to support it. It's, <laughs> it's just outstanding. So anyways, I'm, I'm encouraging the audience, have a look, do what you can. <laughs> Mary Lou is doing amazing work. And thank you for coming in and sharing As are uh, you. this time with us. <laughs> thank you for having me and between me. And, um, you know, again, I would love to talk to you about your storied career. That would be really fun sometime. Maybe. Do, has anybody ever done that? Flip the, flip the <laughs> tables on you? It would be a blast. No, I, but, I'm here to serve people like yourself, who, who and, and especially you because of the work you're doing. And it's you know so you know i've got a really a diverse audience and uh, that audience can support you for sure so well, thank you I'm so saying, much look at Barry Lou's work please <laughs> okay so, yeah we have some again. videos that maybe we can link to that means you don't have to understand the math that i made for um <laughs> okay i'll admit a, a large publication that says fourth grade <laughs> I'm also, I made these animations that explain it so you don't have to do the math and maybe we can link to it on the website. Yeah, that'd be very good. So in the uh, profile, if you can send that to Ev, anything that you think we can put in your profile when the interview goes out and then we'll put that yeah, out. Sure. So, so again, thank you so much. And, thank you. Uh, I'm going to do anything so much. I can to support what you're doing. <laughs> it's just amazing. And vice versa. Thanks a lot okay. for between us this week. Okay, take care. Thank you for listening to The Brand Called You videocast and podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience, and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website, www.tbcy.in, to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search for The Brand Called You.